Welcome to our Community Safety Forum on Gun Violence. Today we'll meet a family who's been impacted by gun violence, not once, but twice. This issue affects us disproportionately and the resolution rate is usually lower. Again, these are family members of victims, but before I introduce them, I wanna show you the clip of a young man who in 2016 was gunned down by a person possessing a gun, most likely illegally. Watch this clip. Tonight, the father of a young man shot and killed in Capitol Heights has a message for young people, live to your fullest potential. Absolutely, that's what family members say 27-year-old Carrington Carter did until a gunman stole that promise one week ago today. It was just after 10 last Friday night, police responded to the sound of gunshots at this dead-end street, Peppermill Drive at White Pearl Place. Carter was found on the ground with several gunshot wounds to the upper body. This can't go in vain. I'm his voice now. He has no voice. Carrington Carter Sr. is speaking loudly. I mean, guns aren't the problem. People are the problem. As you can imagine, this has been an overwhelming experience. Um, the family is, is really grappling with the, the reason behind all of this. And so right now we have lots of questions, no answers, but we know that there is a killer or some killers on the loose. And we know that the detectives are doing all that they can, but I just wonder, you know, how, you know, you know, people in the community are, are aiding uh, this effort. So, you know, you know unless you have um, any other questions, you know, he's asking about what we think. Right now, Bruce, we're numb. Um, like my husband said, uh, we are the voice for our son at this time. And we are just praying that justice, uh, we will have justice. Yes. My son had a lot of potential, a lot of potential, but that potential is going to go to a cemetery now. And so my, my message is for these young kids, these young men, you know, don't waste your time doing, you know, nonsense. Live up to your full potential. Sadly, the police investigated this case, arrested suspects, brought them to trial, but couldn't get a conviction because the one witness that we had with the information that most likely would have caused a conviction wouldn't speak up. He remained silent in our community. Today's first guest is my brother, Carrington Carter Sr. He is the father of Carrington who you just saw in that clip. He has a second son, Brandon, who watches over him here while little Carrington watches over him from heaven. He's an ordained minister, a husband, of an army vet, a civil servant, an active member of Cap Alpha Psi fraternity, and co-founder of the Carrington Carter II charity. Carrington, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Our second guest is Tyrese McAllister. I mentioned earlier that a double tragedy struck this family. So if you don't already know, Tyrese is our cousin. Three months after the first tragedy in our family, Tyrese's youngest daughter, Ayana, who we call Lolly, was also stricken down in street-related gun violence. Tyrese is also a mother of two, but she has two girls. Her 23-year-old, Indasia, is still here watching Tiger. She is a grandmother, a wife, an auntie, a favorite cousin, she is a mental health practitioner, a professional counselor in that field who deals with crisis management, traumatic events, forensics, and disaster preparedness. She is an active member of the Galilee Baptist Church and of our illustrious Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Tyrese, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So Karen, to let's start with you. How has gun violence impacted you um, and these situations that re revolve around gun violence, spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally, even physically? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the variation between those different aspects of my life, emotional, spiritual, physical, mental, can vary from day to day. <clears throat> I can be strong spiritually one day um, but very weak emotionally on that same day. Um, 
um, when I look at the fact that uh, a member of my, I call it my unit, there are four of us, Chanel, my wife, of course, um, Brandon and Carrington, when, when that one person was snatched away, and, and I like to you know, use a, a phrase that I've heard Ty say often, you know, our, our children weren't victims of gun violence. They were, we, they were taken from us. We didn't lose them to gun violence. I think that's the way you, you normally mm -hmm. put it. Um, but it's definitely impacted me as a, as a minister, a preacher of the gospel, um, not having a desire to preach, not having a desire to serve, not having a desire to want to pray and all of those things is how it has impacted me spiritually. From a physical perspective, I can't tell you the number of nights that I've had, you know, restless nights where I couldn't sleep, where I couldn't, you know, function, you know, my cognitive uh, behaviors or just thoughts and just feelings just weren't up to par. I just couldn't function throughout the day. I had to will myself to get through the day emotionally. You, you know, I hear a song, I see a movie, I'm with a friend, something happens, and then all of a sudden I, I just kind of lose it. And these triggers, you just never know where they're coming from. You don't know when they're going to happen. They just catch you off guard and just, you're in, like, back to where you were when the moment happened, when you were notified. So, you know, Chanel and I uh, just take it moment by moment, day by day, um, the best we can. We just we just manage it. It's very difficult. I don't know how to explain it. But people who are, who have sat in my shoes, like Ty, understand exactly what I'm trying to say. What kind of things do you can you say you've actively done to manage your peace of mind or to get recentered when these unexpected moments crop up? Um, it depends on where I am, what I'm doing. Uh, if I'm in my car and the moment hits and I'm, I'm finding myself quite emotional, I just push through and drive. Sometimes I've had to pull over. Uh, but for me, um, hurting people, I know that hurting people hurt other people, but I also know that hurting people through helping others is a way to, to help get you back center. So for me, establishing the Carrington Carter II a charity was a way to give back, a way to keep uh, Carrington's legacy alive, a way to, you know, not lose, you know, sight of the fact that he was a remarkable human being. And I have to try to think about the good things, the wonderful times. I have to just try to think of 10 things, as Chanel and I often do, think of 10 things I'm grateful for. And that helps me, you know, whether it's I'm grateful for a roof over my head, clothes on my back, the fact that I'm still working even through COVID-19, whatever it is, I get through those 10 things and I just keep going. And before I know it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better about life. That's good stuff. Yeah. That's good stuff. Tyrese, I'd, I'd like to pose those same questions to you. How do you, how do you manage through the days? What are the range of emotions you experience? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, very similar to Carrington. Um, grief is a, a very interesting thing, but I think the thing I want to hit on mainly is um, being a servant to others. I, too, am a co-founder of the Ayana J. McAllister Legacy Foundation, and we just try to stay um, very active. And our foundation is really teaching people how to advocate for gun violence, because like you mentioned earlier, gun violence in the African-American community or black and brown communities um, the numbers are outrageous and they've been outrageous. We talk about, uh, we talk a lot about um, school shootings, but school shootings are 3% of the shootings that happen in the United States. What really happens and what has been happening is all of the shootings that happen to black and brown people and nobody advocates and we can't sit back and wait for somebody to come save us. We've got to be able to save ourselves, which I'm very thankful for um, Monique Anderson Walker, Councilwoman of um, District 8 and the Deltas coming up with this forum to talk about community safety because it's sad when you have a very good young man like Carrington, coach AAU, college graduate, um, working on his master's at um, Georgetown. Georgetown University and you have Ayana, a 18-year-old um, girl who's in college freshman year um, wants to be a, a law enforcement officer, they're gunned down. There's no good reason, but nobody talks about that. And the thing about our family that's different is we're going to make them talk about it. Like, we're going to be in your face. 
Um, what are you doing about gun violence? We are holding our elected officials accountable to get the guns off the street, the access to guns. We are holding ourselves and other people accountable uh, to do something about gun violence. How do you stay centered in all of this? How do you, how do you keep your inner peace in all of this? Well, one, I'm a mental health professional, so I have 25 years of being on the other side of the table. So for 25 years of my career, I've been the one who been who has been either giving the news that somebody has lost a loved one or um, doing homicide response through my job. Um, and I, I mean, it's really weird to say, but I really believe that uh, God gave me this career path to, because he knew what was coming for me, right? So I knew um, to stay centered with my um, spirituality, not necessarily religion. I have an amazing support network. I have um, amazing family, amazing friends. Um, the um, Ayana J. McAllister Legacy Foundation has an amazing board um, that works, that does a lot of work. Um, my husband um, too is extremely supportive and we support each other because um, while he's supportive of me, I have to realize he lost his baby girl. Thank you, Tyrese, for that answer. That was powerful. Earlier, we showed you a clip of uh, Little Carrington's news reports, but now I want to take you to a clip with Ayana's parents that appeared after the notification of Ayana's death. Take a look at this clip. She was home on spring break. Now a local college student will never make it back to school. Someone shot 18-year-old Ayana McAllister in Northeast D.C. last night while she was out with friends. Ayana died several hours later. Tonight, her father spoke to News 4 Shamari Stone and said the family was still dealing with another tragedy when this happened. A very numb feeling right now. Anthony McAllister mourns over the murder of his youngest daughter, 18-year-old Ayana. Um, I just miss her warm smile, the close relationship that we have. Ayana McAllister was shot at this parking lot in Northeast D.C. She died at a hospital. Where it's a senseless uh, act of violence. She was visiting home from St. Augustine University in North Carolina on spring break. She went out with her friends, including a rapper who was filming a music video last night. Uh, and they were just kind of spending time with him yesterday. Ayana's family says that she was at this parking lot last night on the 4200 block of Blaine Street Northeast. She was here watching the filming of the rap music video. Once the filming wrapped up, that's when someone pulled out a gun and fired several shots. Ayana's friend was grazed with a bullet in the shoulder. She has non-life-threatening injuries. She was at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's the second homicide to affect this family. In an unrelated case, I reported on the murder of Ayana's cousin, Carrington Carter, four months ago. He was also shot and killed outside an apartment complex in Capitol Heights. Um, but this is two families who are definitely suffering, uh, and we just ask for all the prayers. While police investigate both murders, this heartbroken family searches for answers. Why were two young lives taken way too soon? So many times we've seen clips on the news of people crying endlessly in the streets because nobody will speak up in, with information about what has happened uh, during criminal activities. Um, that keeps this whole idea of snitching going on in our communities. Carrington, tell me what you think about this, this, this whole idea of snitching. Let me first, uh, let me say this first. Um, Knowing who my killers, my, who was involved in my son's murder uh, was not an issue. We knew within the first 24 hours who actually did it. Mm -hmm. We knew who was involved. We knew the reasons why. We knew a whole lot. And we fed that to law enforcement. Law enforcement was getting information um, in, in respect to our case. Uh, so we, we actually knew what was going on. It was just a matter of catching the guys that were involved. Uh, once the arrests were made, the initial arrest was made, uh, the person that was initially arrested wasn't the person that actually did it. He actually was with Carrington, allegedly as his friend, to be in whatever situation they were in. The two people that were the shooter and the accomplice of the shooter, on the other hand, um, they were picked up much later in the process. A lot of that had to do with the fact that the initial person that was arrested 
uh, refused to talk about who did it until he got fed up being in jail. And then when he got fed up, he actually said, this is what happened. These are the steps that were taken. I mean, this is how the scenario played out, is what I'm saying. Uh, he was also given an opportunity to, uh, with his testimony, be released from prison. So At he was going to be given immunity. So he was going exactly. Okay. He was going to be given immunity provided he provided a solid testimony because the way he told the story and the way the evidence was laid out at the, at the scene, his testimony corroborated the, the the scene of the crime. Okay. So he also had details that only a person that was at the scene could have told. Okay. Again, that corroborated the story. So fast forward, we, we finally get the two people, the, the shooter and his accomplice, incarcerated. And then the person that was there with Carrington as a alleged friend, um, he actually ended up getting arrested for another crime, and it was actually a murder. All right. So this, this murder was almost like a year later, and now he's incarcerated in D.C. At, this, at that point, he was fearing for his family's life outside while he's inside. So the fact that he's now in the jailhouse, you know, there's a, a thing about jailhouse snitches. Well, there's also a thing about snitches in the street, in the community and neighborhood. Well, one, one thing I like to say about that is simply this. If you have complete facts about a crime, you're not a snitch. You then are a truth bearer. And it's important to bear the truth so that justice can be served. So as we went through the trial, the shooter was acquitted. His accomplice was found not guilty on all charges, and these guys walked. And oh, by the way, they're back in jail at, as we speak. The, the person that was you know, given immunity at the beginning actually had the opportunity to talk, and he refused to testify. So the judge, based on law, did not force him to testify. He held him in Prince George's County because he was actually locked up in D.C. He held him in Prince George's County, uh, for up to like 20 days or something like that, or 30 days was the max. And the guy refused to testify. There is no law that makes or, you know, forces a person to testify, even under these circumstances. And at one point, the judge, you know, was going to throw out or, or um, vacate certain charges that were, were on the shooter. And he made this statement that I never will forget. He says, hey, this guy's on, char on, on trial for murder. These other little add-on charges, we're not just going to pile on. And I'm thinking, like, what about the dirt that's piled on my son? He doesn't have a right. So as far as snitching is concerned in the, in the communities and even in jail, it comes down to one simple word, fear. And until we get to a point where we're not afraid, until men and women in the community stand up, for what's right and hold people accountable, we're always gonna be in this vicious cycle of people not telling. But oh, by the way, if it's your kid, you see it all the time on the news, if it's your kid, if it's your loved one that's gunned down in the street, you see mamas and daddies, cousins and whoever, crying, begging for people to come forward and talk. So it's, it's really kind of frustrating, even to the point where uh, there was a jailhouse witness in, in the case of, or in the trial of the accomplice, there was a, a jailhouse witness who's, who was able to testify that the accomplice gave, you know, incriminating uh, information. Only the information that somebody at the scene could have given. They threw, the, the, the jury actually did not believe the jailhouse snitch, if you will, because they felt like he was just trying to get his way out of jail. Absent the facts, they just felt like, you know, he was just trying to look out for himself. So... Until we get beyond this fear thing. So here's the reality of it. Had this young man been stopped eight crimes ago, he probably wouldn't have done these things that have perpetuated over the years. And oh, by the way, now you're saying he's back in jail. He's back in jail. Um, and the interesting thing is that he is on trial for another murder. The, the person that killed my son um, as he's been incarcerated, he's now been charged with a murder that occurred in September of 2016. So he killed my son in December of 2016, but he actually killed somebody else in September of 2016. And oh, by the way, after he killed Carrington, somebody in the streets decided that they were going to retaliate. He, was, he got away. 
he turned around to kill somebody that tried to kill him because of Carrington's death. So this kid is just out here, just just wreaking havoc. And the the judicial system is 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 not to our advantage, in my opinion, because the police do everything they can to lock folks up, but then the lawyers get the criminals off on technicalities, or the judges just don't really give a shit. Wow. Tyrese, he said a mouthful there. A mouthful. A mouthful. What can you, what light can you shed on what we can do as individuals, as upstanding members of a community, to help ensure, at least increase the safety rate in our, in our communities to keep this vicious cycle from continuing? There's a lot of things that we have to do. One, we have to um, take a look in the mirror. What Carrington is talking about as it relates to snitching, or um, to st turn the state's evidence is something that we have to address in our community. It is prevalent, it is generational. Like I heard it from my mother, my mother heard it from her mother, and the, and the issue really is that we have, we have to be able to tell on people who are doing wrong in our community. We have to be able to address people who are doing wrong in our community. Mm -hmm. And it has to start before someone is murdered. It has to start when you see a gun, when you know someone has a gun. I was at a meeting in um, DC um, with some police for a, a totally different issue. It was work related. And they were talking about the community in which my daughter was killed and talking about how the people in that community had guns, but the police were not able to do anything about it because they can't just go into their homes um, and take the guns. And so we have to do things that empower our police officers too. Um, we have to be able to, to support good police officers. Right. We get up in arms when white people kill us, right? So everybody is up in arms now because two white men killed a black jogger. However, we don't have the same outrage mm -hmm. when we kill our, our own. Our own. Mm -hmm. We've got to really, we got to look at this thing because we are killing our own a lot more than anybody else is killing us. I am not saying anybody else should be able to kill us. I am not saying the police should be able to um, kill African-American men or women. But what I am saying is that we've got to be more accountable. So some of the things that come to mind besides working on a whole notion of snitching is to be more accountable, to talk to our young people about um, guns and the dangers of guns, become aware, look at the, even trafficking, because there are no black gun manufacturers and we're not bringing guns into our own community. Mm -hmm. Or we're getting them from somebody and bringing them into our community. And so we have to have a, a different sense of love. It also starts from a young age. Carrington painted a very the picture of this um, young man who is a menace to society, right? An absolute menace, but he wasn't born that way. There's something that happens to our children that takes away their joy and their hope in life. One of the things we were able to do in the course of planning this forum was to speak to a young man who actually was on the wrong side of the law. Take a look at his clip. Well, from the age of 13 to present, at 13 I was involved with a gun crime. I was arrested for that and adjudicated in the juvenile justice system. And uh, that's kind of like started my, that kind of like started a domino effect because of that charge that I had when I was 13, it led to a multitude of other things, right? And self-preservation became one of the main things based off of that. Um, if you go a little further, a few years after that, I was shot myself personally. I was shot in the spine, I was shot in the leg, and I was shot in the butt. I had to have multiple surgeries, and I uh, initially was paralyzed. I was paralyzed from the waist down, and I had to learn how to walk again. So even once I learned how to walk again, after that, I was rearrested again for having a firearm. I had a firearm, as I say, it's a backstory. I had a firearm not because I was trying to run around and do something to a person, but because I was shot. I believe that, hey, if I got a gun, the next time if someone tries to hurt me, I'll be able to better defend myself. I'm not saying I'm going to win, but I'm saying I have a chance. Without a firearm at the time with my mentality, right, and without the, the, the communication as we spoke about once before, previous to this interview, without that communication, it was basically just a straight up situation that was on site, you know? So if it's an on site situation, then there's no communication. So all we know is we're at war or we're beefing, right? So. I say 
that that was the purpose for me having the gun laid on. As I continue, as leading up, uh, I got out of that situation dealing with the ju judicial system and I came back into the community. And when I was back into the community, I wind up uh, catching another charge dealing with a firearm. I got bonded out and the case was dismissed. Uh, a year after that, I wind up being arrested again in uh, federal court and charged in federal court with the drugs and the firearm charge. And I wind up doing 13 years and two months for that. I went to jail as, as ironic as we spoke of. Today is May 17, 2020. I went to jail for this exact charge on May 17, 2003. I returned back to the community in 2015 to the halfway house and I was released from the halfway house in 2016. So currently I work in the community, I have a nonprofit, and I work with people and I try to do things to alleviate some of the things that I went through and I've been successful to a degree in doing it. With my background, you know, I, I, I've been a, a, a person that was raised in the streets, uh, pretty much been in the streets my whole life. I'm very familiar with, you know, the, the, the workings of the streets due to the fact that that's the culture I was raised in. I was raised in Washington, D.C during a time when it was the murder capital. So gun violence is very prevalent and has played a, played a major part in my life as far as, you know, me knowing countless people who have, who have been uh, affected by it, such as myself, you know, uh, being a victim, uh, being a person that, that has been has participated with dealing with gun violence, being, a, I would say, the perpetrator. So I think that, I, I, that that qualifies me to speak on the matter. You say perpetrator. Give us... Tell me what that's all, what that's all about. Uh, I mean, I was the person that was that was carrying the gun at one time. You know, uh, me carrying the gun, me defending myself, me trying to self-preserve my own life, me trying to self-preserve the life for those around me that I can I love about. You know, some people call me a perpetrator. I call me a defender of you know trying to just live. But I'm going to use the general term that's more commonly known. Uh, in my opinion, the mentality in the streets is you know. I want to make it home, you know, uh, I'm not going to let you hurt me, you know, I, I, I don't want to be a victim, I'd rather be in jail where you can come and see me again as opposed to being in a cemetery where I can never speak to you again, it's a slaying, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by 6, you know, that's not a mentality that people just wake up with and just go out the house and say I'm going to do something with a gun today, right, everything has something that leads up to stuff, no one just wakes up and stuff just happens, there's always a backstory to it. Let's say, let, let's, let's go to the part where people are going out there committing crimes and no one's after you, no one's doing something. You, you're looking at a chance of opportunity, I guess, I don't know. Tell us about the mentality of when people actually, you know, let their hammer fall, let it loose for whatever reason. Well, like I said, it's always a backstory, so it's something that just lead up to that, right? I mean, and if we're speaking specifically at this moment to the uh, African American community, I mean, history shows and time have shown that we just don't randomly go into places and shoot places up. That's not something that's normal with us. Not saying that it doesn't happen, but that's not something that's normal. So I believe even when a person does let their gun go, as, as you stated in the question, or choose to, you know, let the hammer fall or whatever, it's something that leads up to that, 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 that gets to that. If it's a robbery, that person can't pay a bill. If it's a shooting, right? That person may feel some form of anger that leads them up to the point of using that gun. But I don't believe personally that a person just wakes up and says, I'm going to use my gun today for no apparent reason, right? That just generally doesn't make sense as a human. Like, we just don't do stuff just because. In the neighborhood that I grew up in, I grew up in a residential neighborhood, right? And we knew some of the people was going to call the police. You feel what I'm saying? It was understood. You know, we never once said, you know, uh, we wanted to do anything to them people. We understood that, like, listen, here come Miss such and such, or here come Mr. such and such. Hold up for a minute until they go in the house. Because our common sense told us that if they see you doing something, they're going in there to call the police. They, they rely amongst that, amongst their self in, in that circle. That's what I was speaking of earlier about, you know, distorting and mixing it, right? Now society has got it twisted so much that that mister or that miss such and such, a lot of the young guys say that, oh, she's snitching now, or he's snitching now, right? And that's where it got distorted at. Where it really got distorted at was the lack of respect 
for people. The lack of respect of understanding that, like I said, that person need, need to go in and call the police. Don't come out here with a gun and try to defend the, the, the neighborhood, you know. Uh, sort of vigilante using George Zimmerman, for example. Let's, let's speak about that, right? That's exactly what he did. He went out into the community and tried to control it on his own, wind up killing the young brother Tray Trayvon Martin, right? And the thing down in Georgia right now with Amar Aubrey, right? Those are prime examples where they wouldn't have been considered snitches, but they could have called the police. They could have called the police and say, hey, we think that we got a person in the community that's doing something wrong. That's not snitching. You know, I think that, that they get that confused and mixed up. When you're participating in any unlawful activity and you go against the code of, hey, speaking, then the guy's going to consider you a snitch. But if Miss Jenkins come off her porch and tell the police she saw what happened, Miss Jenkins ain't snitch. Miss Jenkins just being a civilian. She's making a, a civilian move. She's doing what she does as a civilian. So I think that, like I said earlier, I think that we got to distinguish the two. And I think that the mentality, if you want to get away from that mentality in the community, I think that the mentality has to be broken and something else has to be in, implanted into what we're feeding to our, to our next generation. Well, now at the point I am in my life, you know, I'm very much more conscious, you know, because the person that you're speaking to today most definitely wasn't the person that was running around in the streets, right? About the, guy in the, street? uh, the guy in the streets, I wasn't, uh, I'm not going to say I was a renegade or I was a, a bad person. You know, I've done a lot of things for people. You know, I just had an illegal means of way of getting the, the funds and, and the things that I did in order to do those things. I still do a lot of things for people right now. I'm just doing it from getting it from a legitimate source, right? So. The core of who you are is who you are. That's what I personally believe. One thing about who you are is who you are. I don't care if you're working or if you're in the streets. And I've had the opportunity to realize that because I work. I've been working for the past five years, right? I've been employed consistently for the past five years and I'm employed as we're doing this video. But to say uh, the guy that was in the streets not being as conscious as I am now because I was conscious about my side of the equation, really not about the other side of the equation, really not giving that as much thought as I give it now. But at the point that I am now, in hindsight, looking back, right, I really don't wish that on no one's family. The part that frustrates me is that with most people who have not dealt with gun violence as we have, it's not an issue for them, if, quite frankly, and if, if the truth be told, it wasn't an issue. It wasn't as personal. It, it didn't affect me right. as much until it happened to me. I right. got sick of day in and day out watching the news prior to Carrington's death. I got sick of seeing people being gunned down every day. Mm -hmm. And there are times literally since his death where I want to reach out to uh, victims, uh, family members that remain, right? Reach out to them and say, we're gonna make it. You know, we're gonna make, we're gonna get through this. This is, these are the steps that we need to take. I wanna reach out to them, but when that first happens, you're not in a space where you can receive that. But I really want our, our leaders to understand that this is not lip service anymore. It's time out for thoughts and prayers. It's time out for what I'm gonna do. I need to know what you have done. And I wanna, I wanna know for certain that you have a solid plan to implement as soon as you're in that, as soon as your butt is in that seat, I wanna know that you're gonna be taking us seriously. Because we don't have an opportunity now to go back and talk to our son and say, or our daughter and say, what would you want us to do? We are their voice now. Mm -hmm. And so we, there, are many of, there are many others like us going through a similar situation. And again, it's time out for thoughts and prayers. It's time for action. Carrington and Tyrese are just two in the thousands of people in the Washington metropolitan area and millions of people across this country impacted personally by gun violence. Today, thank you for coming out and telling your stories, providing advice, giving us food for thought. Thank you enough that you care to form these foundations that teach people how to be better in their communities and that provide scholarships to students going to college and that give hope. Thank you for coming out. Remember, there are things you can do in your very own community to help promote safety, and to keep people away from the violence that guns bring. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy.